these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look. What's the second one? A lying tongue. How does God feel about a lying tongue? It's an abomination to Him. He hates it. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. A false witness who speaks what? Lies. Twice. You say, well, why are you dealing with this? That's exactly what Paul did. In Romans 3, the overflow of the mouth, they speak wickedness. The, the, the poison of asps is under their tongue. Because what comes out of here reveals what? What's in here? The overflow of our mouth reveals what's in our heart. And if deceit is coming out of here, what does it mean is in our heart? Deceit. That's part of the problem. If you're deceiving others, good potential is that you're deceived yourself in areas of your own heart and there are things you're hiding there. That's what happens. This is things that God hates. A false witness who speaks lies. One who sows discord among who? Brethren. God hates this stuff. So what do we do? We know what the consequence of it is, don't we? How about this? So let's stay there. Turn, turn back to Psalm and uh, the Psalms. And, and look at... Um, Look at Psalm 7 and verse 11. This is, you know, we're remembering something of the way God is towards the characteristics that are being revealed here and the people that are doing them. This is what's going on. Those things who do these things, look at verse 11 of chapter 7, of, of, or Psalm, Psalm 7 and, and verse 11. God is a what? He is just. And He is a judge. So what is His perspective towards things? those who are doing things that they ought not to? Or wicked things? What does it say? That God is angry. And we don't tend to think that way. We don't tend to want to think that way. But this is the way it really is. That's part of having our minds renewed so we begin to agree with the way God thinks. The best we can do is think God's thoughts after Him. His thoughts are always right and true and good. They're always true truth. God's thoughts. And so when we agree with God, that's the best we can do. Because you're not going to come up with anything new, all right, guys? Right? You're not smarter than God. You don't understand reality better than He does. You're not ones that they are like, well, okay, well, God, I know you think it's this way, but I know the truth because it's really like this. He'd say, well, no, actually, I know the truth and you're wrong. He'd say. I know that's not popular in our day, but that's what He does say. And if you speak things that are not from God, He says, I'll get into your face and I'll call you a liar because it's presumption. That's what He warned the prophets of. God is angry with the wicked. Well, how often? Or Every day. So do you think it's serious? You guys like would think having God angry at you is a good idea? I don't think so. Wouldn't want to be on his bad list. But that's where we start. God is angry at the wicked all day long. There are things that make God angry and he hates. But l l turn over a couple of pages to Psalm 11. Look at verse 5. In fact, let's back up to verse 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous 
But the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul, what? That's strong language, guys. It is. It's not fun, but this is the truth. This is God's holy word. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. That's intense language. Don't you think? Now why take the time for this? Well, the thing is, guys, is that if God brings judgment and you're not quite clear why, you think something's amiss. When God takes a person and in the day of judgment lays bare everything they've done, and judgment comes down, and hell is a real place. There will be no one in that day who will say, God, I don't think you're being fair here. God, no, that's not right. In fact, when the law is raised at that point, every mouth goes silent before God because we run out of excuses. We run out of reasons how to justify ourselves. And we stand guilty before a holy God. We stand condemned before a holy God. It's not that, well, I've rejected the cross, now I'm condemned. No, we're condemned and judged because of our sin before God. Because of the things we've done wrong. Is there a higher law than God's law? No. When we rebel and break God's holy law, there is no appellate court. There is no higher judge to appeal to. It's... One writer put it this way, it's like cosmic treason when we break God's law. And God takes it personally. You know why? Because His law is a reflection of His character. And it's an affront to Him as a being. He's holy. The Bible is so clear on it that well, let's turn, let's turn to Romans chapter 3 again. and We need to understand this because when it comes to the cross, when it says that Christ died for sins, He suffered for sins. Well, He's suffering for a reason. The passion there, that word for passion there, is something that He's, he's suffering for real. What He's going through, the experience of what He has there, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Notice in verse 10, it says these, For it is written, there is none who. Righteous. Thank you very much. There is none righteous. No, not one. So are there exceptions to this rule? So when someone says, well, actually, I'm not that bad. Well, I actually know God says there's no one righteous, not one. There is none who, what? Understands. Naturally, no one understands. Um, there is none who, what? Seeks God. None. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does, what? Not one. I mean, I've heard people say, listen, oh, I, was, I came into the world and then I was like a really, really good person and I did stuff. I wasn't that bad anyway. And I was good and good and then I like became a Christian and then I am good. No. God says there's no one good. No, not one. It places the necessity of what Christ did and His payment on the cross right in the center of it. It says, listen, there is no one who's good. No, not one. All have become unprofitable. There's no one righteous. All have sinned. We've all missed the mark of God's glory. Therefore, there's a necessity of the cross. There's, there's, one, there's something that has to take place in the justice of God so that I can take these who are sinners and and I can take them and place them in the camp of those who are accepted. 